Let's program a marker. This is a marker and in crossbar systems such as this number one crossbar and the number five crossbar over there, the marker is the common main common control aspect of the system. The marker controls all of the behavior of the switching frames themselves. In fact, that was a really important thing about the development of common control switching, including the crossbar switches and also the panel switches that came before them, um, that there was a central controller that was doing all of the smart work and each individual switching element was, you know, in didn't really have a whole lot of smarts to it. It was just a frame of wires all connected to each other. So here in the number one crossbar, we have one originating marker, and down at the other end of the aisle, we have a terminating marker as well. But for today, we just want to talk about the originating marker. So the originating marker consists of three relay cabinets, uh, just chock full of um, cool, important relays and a bunch of fancy wiring behind them. And it also consists of this and this uh, sort of it's, you know, in modern terms we call it a patch bay. Um, and what we're doing here at the patch bay is we are making connections between different points to, in effect, program the marker and tell it how to connect us when we want to make a call. So today what we're doing is we are introducing a new office code into the number one crossbar. So there's a bunch of different offices that this can call. Uh, 830, 832, 833, 722, blah, 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 blah. And today we are introducing a brand new office that I can call uh, Lakeview 4 or 524. In order to do that, we need to tell the switch how to actually connect that call. And to do that, we are going to redo some of the punchings, the cross connections here that will then instruct the switch how to connect the call on its switching fabric. In the number one crossbar, the switching fabric is these frames. The more gold colored frame is the district link and the more silver colored frame is the office link. And the office link is where the outgoing trunks to other switches actually appear. Now in a full-size number one crossbar office, there would be whole aisles of just these frames. But here in the museum, we only have one district link and one office link. So all of my trunks appear on the horizontal levels of the office link. And these trunks will go to other places in the museum. And what the marker is going to do is once I dial the first three digits of the telephone number into the sender, the sender will pass that information to the marker. The marker is going to then decode that information. And having done so, among other things, it will proceed to actually set up the links on these frames to get me from this, from my subscriber line, through my district juncter, through the district link, through the office link, and then out to the rest of the world. Here's how it works. The marker receives as input a three digit office code. Once it's received that office code, it will then go here and each of these terminals is gonna be uh, grounded by its own office code. For instance, Here's the terminal for the new office code that we're adding, 524. And when I dial 524 and the marker registers that, it's gonna fire, or it's gonna put ground on this terminal. That ground is connected to the operate winding of route relay number 15, which is that one. So when this office code is dialed, this will be grounded and route relay 15 will then operate. This is where it gets cool. Once Route Relay 15 operates, it's going to close a whole bunch of contacts. Each of those contacts is assigned to one of these, of each of these groups of punchings. So if we look at this group of punchings and we go up to one, zero, oh, two, three, four, five, there's the, there's the punching that goes back to Route Relay 15. And 
On this block, there's also 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. There's the punching that goes back to route relay 15. Each of these punchings and the rest of them as we go across and also down here, each of these punchings will have to be cross-connected to another punching on this field. And the way it's cross-connected, it determines how the marker is going to decode that information. So Route Relay 15 operates, a contact closes on 15, grounding this cross-connection. This point is then connected to one of these points, which is then connected back into the marker itself, which operates a relay that in turn tells the marker how to behave on that call. So for any call, we're going to need a minimum subset of information that the marker, basically the marker knows what the minimum amount of information it needs to connect that call is. And if it doesn't get that minimum amount of information, there's a checking circuit inside that says, I don't have enough information and it will fail out and route you out to uh, you know, a permanent signal trunk or to an announcement machine. So in order for the marker to be successful, we have to give it at least the bare minimum it needs to route the call correctly. So that's gonna be group start. Where do I start looking on the office frame for the trunk? Group end. Where do I stop looking on the office frame? What trunk level am I at? There's a certain number of horizontal levels on the office frame. So what trunk level do I look at? What office frame do I start looking on? We only have one office frame, so it's always going to be the same for us. Then, if I'm going to go out to like a distant panel tandem or a distant crossbar tandem, what selections do I need to make on that distant tandem in order to complete the call? Now, the office code that we're setting up today does involve a distant panel tandem, so we're going to actually go from our switch to out to a distant switch and then circle back to ourselves. So I'm gonna to need to tell it the office brush and office group coordinates on the panel switch, which is over on the other side of the room. So it'll need to know that as well. And then it's going to need to know a compensating resistance. So how much resistance do I have to add to this trunk for proper signaling? And some other little tiny auxiliary things about how to handle the distant end of the trunk when we get there. So what I have to do essentially is connect all of the correct cross points. What I'm going to do first is connect them with alligator clips because that way I can test and if something's wrong I can move the alligator clips around. So let's do that now. Some of the punchings are a little bit more complicated because they have uh, two layers of information. Like there's, for each individual punching, there's two possibilities encoded on top of each other. So I need to actually check the, uh, the circuit schematic for the marker to determine which punchings I need. In this case, the two punchings I'm thinking about are office brush and office group. Now, those two punchings refer to the I keep calling them coordinates. They're not really coordinates. But it's referring to once this call leaves the crossbar office and heads over to the panel office, it's going to make two selections, an office brush selection and an office group selection. It's going to make the rod on the panel switch go up to a certain point, and then that is going to bounce the call back here to the number one crossbar. And there's punchings in the marker to declare, basically, this is, where, this is the office brush and this is the office group you need to hunt to before continuing the call. Uh, so I have the schematic here and I'm just gonna write down basically what I need to do. All right, I got the two punchings I need, so let's go back over to the marker. Now that we've strapped in our cross connections at least temporarily with alligator clips, 
let's go ahead and test the marker to see if it actually accepted the information we gave it. Um, four. And it didn't. Now the reason for this is because when the marker was actually brought to the museum, it was completely cut from the route relay base that we were just cross-connecting. So the marker saw that uh, the office code we entered, Lakeview 4, and tried to access the route relay and the grounds that, or the grounds that were coming back through those punchings, but when it tried, there was nothing there. So essentially what it just gave us back was nonsense. Or just like, I, not only could I not route that call, I couldn't even determine what you wanted me to do in the event that I couldn't route the call. That's how, that's how hard I just failed. So what we have to do to actually fix this is go and reconnect the wires on the back side. Now I've been doing this for a few months now. Um, just doing them one by one or you know ten or so at a time as I have the time um, This is a really big job, and it's probably going to take me a couple years to connect everything Fortunately though for what we're doing today. I don't need to connect the several hundred wires um, That will put everything back together. I just need to connect enough that this uh, That the series of cross connects we just put in will work. So let's go do that I'll leave the camera running while I'm doing this, but I'm probably going to be moving all over the frame. Just a fair warning. So when these machines were removed from service, especially the number one crossbar in the panel, the, uh, the scrappers or whoever was in charge of that basically just cut all the wires. Um, now there was always a question for me of why they did that. And what it really comes down to is insurance value. You see, when, when these switches were actively in service switching calls, they were worth you know, million, millions of dollars, at least when they were new. I mean, when they were old, presumably hundreds of thousands. But not only the, the worth they had in you know, the, the cost of the material and of the equipment itself, but the value it had to the phone company um, as being a part of its infrastructure. So when they scrapped the switches, part of the deal was is that if they cut them out, they had to destroy them, uh, basically for insurance purposes. They needed to make it so that they were functionally no longer capable of doing their job of switching calls. And uh, so the way they did that was by cutting the wires that ran in between the frames. You know, by cutting these wires between the marker and the route relay bay, you're essentially destroying the marker's ability to do anything worthwhile. And now, it's only worth its price in, you know, in metal, in base metal, bare metal. Um, now, yeah, you could do what I'm doing and you could repair all this wiring, but as you can see, it's going to take quite a long time. And it would be, you know, easier to, to some extent just to install a brand new digital switch than it would be to repair each one of these individual wires and get this old thing working. So for the purposes of writing it off the books, uh, they did this to pretty much all the equipment. They just destroyed it like this. Which is, you know, it's too bad. But at least it gives me a job to do.
Now that we've got those wires connected, uh, it's doing a little better here in the test frame. We're still missing a few things though, but we'll take a look and see how it's going. One of the problems I do see uh, is looking at these progress lamps here. The m current most alarming thing is that TK is not lit. That means the marker didn't pass its internal sanity check to make sure that reasonable things were grounded. Now what that means is I likely just forgot to hook something up, which is okay. I just need to go back over my, uh, my wiring and make sure that I put everything where it should be. And I probably made a mistake. Once everything is working, once I see a TK indication here, then I can be fairly sure that the rest of this is going to go okay, assuming the trunks are actually wired up to the office link frame all right. And I know they are already because I did that um, months ago and I've been using these trunks for other things. So really what we just want is a TK indication coming from the marker. Here's the page describing the TK relay so you can kind of get an idea of what it does. This rectangle here is the actual winding of TK. This is what would operate it. And we can see that it operates from 48 volts through the winding through this big super long chain of things in series and things in parallel. And what this is doing is basically one last check on the marker's uh, decoding of the office code into uh, what it's actually going to use, the data that it's actually going to process to make the connection to the trunk and pass back to the sender. And without going too needlessly deep into it, we can see here that TK goes through this and then it hits uh, this decision tree here has to do with the class of call and the amount of compensating resistance that we, that we can add to the trunk. And if we follow these lines, it's evident that only certain paths through here are, are possible or logical. And if we don't have one of these logical, possible, reasonable connections, TK, the operating path through TK won't get to ground. So really, if I wasn't sure, what I could do is start at TK and go through this entire page, making sure that every relay that operated in the marker was reasonable, or was operating in a way that would reasonably get ground from here up through this path to TK. But in this particular case, I think it's gonna just be easier to just double check my wiring because I'm sure that it's, I've done this enough times now where I'm sure I just missed something and I'll check for a minute and, and realize. So I'll go do that now. And sure enough, there's the problem. I'm missing compensating resistance punching, which means that the marker isn't getting the minimum amount of information it needs to complete the call. So in order to fix this problem, I'll need to cross connect this to the appropriate punching down here to tell the marker what the value of compensating resistance uh, or build out it should be adding to the trunk. So I'll take care of that right now and we'll test again. And surely enough, now that we uh, attached those wires that I'd forgotten, we have a TK indication, which means that the marker has passed its basic uh, self-check and the, uh, the the setup that we did is you know more or less valid however when I go to place a call we still get a trouble indication so that means that something else is probably wrong let's take a look
Pleased to report it works. Check it out. Last thing to do is replace all of these Bodge jumper wires with properly laid out and soldered wires now that I know everything is going to work great. So you might be asking, hey, back up a little bit. What did we just accomplish with all of this wiring? Well, here at the museum we try our best to have the switches operate in a way that's very close to how they would have worked when they were in active service. One of the things that telephone switches do is called tandem switching. Tandems were used in many larger cities where telephone exchanges on opposite ends of town didn't always have direct trunks between one another. In cases like these, calls would leapfrog through a tandem office, which would then connect you to the destination office. In this way, tandems served as a higher level concentrating points, connecting telephone switches to other telephone switches, instead of subscribers to subscribers. Now, by dialing Lakeview 4 on our number one crossbar, we can ask it to first connect to the panel office, which will serve as a tandem point, and then connect from the panel right back to itself, which will then complete the call. You might have guessed that there's no functional reason to do this in the museum, since the number one crossbar is fully capable of handling this call to itself without using a tandem. And you'd be right. But it's certainly fun to connect our switches together in interesting ways that also serve to illustrate how these machines actually interoperated. One more fun takeaway from this is that callers get to hear some additional signaling sounds on the line while the call is connecting. These sounds would have also been audible to the general public 60 to 70 years ago. Of course, normal folks would have just ignored all the noise while the call is connecting, but telephone geeks like us just love hearing it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. It's worth noting that there's a lot more work involved in connecting a call like this than simply moving a few wires in the marker. These switches are very complicated, and many parts have to work perfectly together in order to complete a call from one telephone to another. The marker cross-connections were really just the last step, a way to let the switch know that it has new paths to use when establishing connections and setting up a call.